This is episode 30 of the Relentless Man podcast, Dao De Ching, part 5. Hi, and welcome to the Relentless Man podcast. I'm your host, Christian Mojaiso, and my goal is to help men die empty, to make sure that you die having used up every ounce of potential that is trapped within you. However, to help you die empty, I'll have to be very raw and brutally honest with you. So if you're easily offended, stop listening. If you're easily triggered, stop listening. If you can't handle explicit language, stop listening. If you are fragile, stop listening. Otherwise, let's dig in. Before we begin this episode, I'd like to urge you not to blindly copy or implement anything that I say in this podcast episode. Rather, what I recommend is that you turn on your brain, that you think for yourself, and that you make sure that every decision that you make is a product of your own thinking and decision-making process. Remember, do not be a follower, be a student. This is, as as has been mentioned in the introduction, this is the fifth part of our series in the Tao Te Ching. And the Tao Te Ching is a text that was written through a guy called Lao Tzu, and translated it means the Book of the Way. And it's a spiritual text that enables you to live in harmony with yourself and the environment around you. And the reason we are tackling this is because it tackles basically every aspect of human life, all the important aspects. It tackles your spiritual dimension. It tackles the learning, and learning is really fundamental towards your success as a relentless man. It's going to tackle leadership. At some point, we'll get to that part. It's going to tackle teaching, and that's another aspect. That's another thing that a relentless man is, a teacher. And so, actually, if you really mastered and worked in accordance with the principles in this text, you'd be able to, <laughs> you'd, have, you'd live really well. Let's just put it that way. You'll have mastered, in a sense, the true essence of what life is. And the main reason, however, that I'm doing this uh, episode, I'm doing this series of episodes on the Tao Te Ching, is first of all because it's going to enable you to discover who you are. That's one of the most fundamental questions that every human needs to answer. And in particular, if you never answer the question, who am I, you'll never be able to realize your true potential. And unfortunately, who you are is something that I can't tell you. I cannot, nobody on the planet can tell you who you are. Only you can discover for yourself who you are. And hopefully the ideas presented in this episode in this, and in the series on the Tao Te Ching will enable you to answer that question. Because once you answer it, you become unstoppable. Once you understand who you are, there's literally no limit <laughs> to what you can accomplish. All right, so let's continue in our series. We're now on the fifth verse of the Tao Te Ching, and it says, The Tao doesn't take sides. It gives birth to both good and evil. The Master doesn't take sides. She welcomes both saints and sinners. So if you haven't been following this series, you might be wondering, well, what is the Tao? That's the thing. The Tao is something that you can't really capture in words. In fact, the more definitive you try to be about the Tao, that's a sure sign that you don't really understand it. And so you could think of the Tao as, you could think of the Tao maybe as life itself. It's, uh, it's one, the force that animates life. It's the force that enables you to move. It's the force that created the universe. If you look at darkness, in a sense, you're looking at the Tao. The space around you is the Tao. Uh, that place where creativity comes from, that's the Tao. So it's, it's, it's something that's very hard to define. And you definitely have a piece of the Tao in you. And that's part of the key to unlocking who you are as a human being. And what the verse is saying is that the Tao doesn't take sides. It gives birth to both good and evil. That is, if the Tao created the world... And we have good things and we have bad things. Well, it means that the Tao created those things. So you could translate it as God, if you like. God created both good and evil. But but, but why is Lao Tzu putting this verse here? In particular, why it's being put here is to make it clear that the whole idea of good and bad is a construct that human beings come up with. There is, we are the ones who attach 
An event in itself is neutral. We attach labels to it. Someone steals your money. It's just an event. But you could say it's a bad event. They took my money. How horrible. You've attached meaning to it and you've gotten an event that's neutral and you've made it bad. Someone else could have the same event. Someone steals my money and instead of labeling it as a bad event, I think about it. I'm like, oh, wow, that person was able to get into my pocket unawares without me being aware and everyone was able to take my money. What does that say about my ability to pay attention? What does that say about how distracted I am? You could look at this event as an opportunity for you to practice being more aware and being glued to the present moment. Because if you are really present and aware, it would have been very difficult for someone to reach in your pocket and steal your wallet. So the same event has now been framed as good, whereas before we framed it as bad. Right. So th- th- this is an interesting fact, is that many th- that's true of the many dualities we have in life. We have something, we label it as beautiful, and then we automatically we label other things as ugly. Certain women are beautiful and others are ugly. Certain ideas are good, others are bad. Certain behaviors are acceptable, others are unacceptable, etc. These are all labels that we place on things. But ultimately, you want to get to the point, like the Tao, where you don't need to label an event as good or bad. It's just an event. Someone stole your wallet, it's just an event. Someone punched you in your face, it's just an event. You tried to solve a problem and didn't solve it, it's just an event. It's neither good nor bad. It's You can think of it as good or bad, or you could overcome the need to label it at all. And that's a higher stage of living. So natural question might be, well, why is it good to not label events as good or bad or to be stuck in this duality, this two-sidedness of things, good, bad, beautiful, ugly, intelligent, stupid, be- uh, creative, uncreative, etc. Well, p- part of the reason why it's a good idea to overcome this duality is because it enables you to find beauty in every moment. It enables you to learn from every situation. For instance... If you get a really evil guy, so, um, okay, an example is like Adolf Hitler, right? So he did a lot of horrible things, committed tons of atrocities, killed tons of people. Now, a natural tendency, and this is what we do, we label him as an evil, bad person, right? But you see, now notice what happens. If you label Adolf Hitler as bad and evil, your brain, (laughs) your mind, the human mind will now your mind will associate it with only negative things. And he did a lot of things that are really negative. But him, like every human being, has lessons to teach us. And if you think of him as evil and bad, you might not be able to dig into him and pick out some lessons. For instance, the things he did were horrible. But there were certain techniques he used. For instance, he used techniques about... He he used a lot of techniques of manipulation. He used a lot of techniques. He helped us understand better how it's possible to get ordinary people and using obedience, get them to do unbelievable, completely immoral things. Now, that lesson we'd learned about it before, but we never learned it as intensely until we saw events like people, like dictators, like Hitler and the things that they were able to do. Now, if you're balanced, if you're a relentless man, you want to be able to learn from both things that we label good and evil. If someone is labeled a saint, you want to learn from him. If someone is labeled a dictator and evil and a killer, you also want to learn from him. Because it's it's really part of being relentless is learning as much as you possibly can. And you want to learn from every situation. If you go into a room and there's shit on the floor, but maybe there are like five pieces of sugar in the, in the shit, you want to be the sort of person that looks at the shit and still sees the sugar in the shit as opposed to just seeing shit and not looking any closer. In the same way, you also want to be the sort of person who, when you get into a room and there's sugar on the floor, you're able to realize the few droppings of shit in the sugar. That is, you want to learn from good situations, bad situations. And part of the way you're able to do that is if you overcome the label of good and bad and just observe events. Someone lied to you, someone betrayed you. You could think of that as a bad event, in which case you now focus on how those people were unfair to you, how they treated you badly, and you go into a negative spiral. Or you could just, they stole from me, they cheated, they took advantage of me. You just put it that way, not good or bad. And then from there, you'd be able to study, be able to extract a lesson 
that can help you to, let's say, avoid getting cheated on in the future. So it's really weird here. Um, so is there any room for good and bad, for the duality of good and evil, etc.? Well, th there is room for it. Um, usually, if we have like a system and we have certain rules, so for instance, if you're, if you're practicing a sport, you want to become really good at, uh, at a given sport, then usually the event winning, winning, the, winning a game is considered a positive thing and losing a game is considered a negative thing. So sometimes you might need those things as good and bad in order to help you to uh, progress, in order to help you to see whether you're improving or not, whether you're learning the right skills or not. So in that case, on, on the level of winning the game and playing effectively, say, as a sportsman, it might be a good idea to have good and bad. But ultimately, you don't want to be stuck in good and bad because if you if you take a large enough perspective, if you look at things from a higher perspective, you, you end up realizing that really, sure, a, a basketball game was lost. If you look at it from the grand scheme of things, it's just an event. You, in fact, you, you'd see people who cry and are completely disappointed by the loss of a game. You'd see them as being kind of petty. If you looked at it from a very, very high uh, 360 degrees kind of perspective. Because the event itself is neutral. It's the meaning we bring to it. Sometimes you want to attach meaning in order to accomplish certain practical things. But ultimately, you want to have what is called negative capability. So negative capability is the concept that you want to be rich. A master, a relentless man is able to hold two contradictory ideas in his brain at the, th at the same time. You want to be able to experience a loss and experience the pain of a loss, but at the same time hold in your mind the idea that it's not that big of a deal. The loss is not that serious because in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's just a game. But you also want to be able to take the game very seriously. So usually people are not uh, very good at that. It, it takes practice to be able to hold two contradictory ideas in your mind at the same time. To look at an individual and not say good or evil maybe say good and evil, be able to look at the person in their goodness and look at the person in their evilness and be able to keep those ideas at the same time. And this, this is a powerful concept, something that the Tao Te Ching talks about a lot. And the Tao is a master. That's why it says the Tao doesn't take sides. It gives birth to both good and evil. The next part of the stanza says, the master doesn't take sides. She welcomes both saints and sinners. That's right. So usually we have a tendency to be nice and friendly to only people that we like, people we think of as nice and good, and people we think of as sinners or evil or just bad, destructive. We don't want to engage them at all. And this is a, this is a limited way of viewing things. Rather, you want to get to the point where you can look at a sinner and still and see a saint, and look at a saint and see a sinner. Because if you look within a saint, you'll find a sinner. And if you look within a sinner, you'll find a saint. Otherwise, if you're so used to labeling things as one way or think about things in one dimension, the end result is that you never see the full picture. You look at a human being and you just say, oh yeah, this guy is just nice, he's beautiful. You associate all the positive emotions with them. And then when they do something that's actually not correct, you're unable to criticize them. Forget that, you're not even able to notice people's mistakes because you've so glorified them. And on the other hand, you've so demonized someone to the extent that even when they do something that's good and correct, when there's a, instead of encouraging that spark of hope, you, you, you extinguish it because you can't associate the person with anything, uh, anything good. Right. So here we are. It's really what <laughs> the Tao Te Ching, what Lao Tzu is asking you to do here is to overcome your biology and social upbringing because usually the way the way, the way we are programmed to work, I don't know if it's only a biology or environment, is to label things as this or that, good or bad, tall or short, strong or weak. That's kind of how we split up, we fracture reality in order to understand it. But to become relentless, you're going to have to overcome your biology, overcome your upbringing, and get to the point where you don't need these buckets. You can see the buckets and you can see beyond the buckets. That's kind of the idea. The next stanza says, The Tao is like a bellows. It is empty, yet infinitely capable. The more you use it, the more it produces. The more you talk of it, the less you understand. So a bellows is a sort of a thing that uh, 
it's a sort of pump, I guess. Uh, I looked at the picture of it. It's one of those things that works on a farm. I think it's some sort of sack, and then there's air inside, and you squeeze it. And it seems empty, but if you squeeze it, it can, I think, release a lot of pressure. It might also be the sort of thing that's used to fan flames. I'm not completely sure. But the idea here is that the DAO is empty yet infinitely capable. So we said before, the DAO is many things. You could think of the DAO as infinite courage, if you like. Well, the thing is, you can't see the DAO. You can't name the DAO. Like, you're seated in your room right now, wherever you are, and there's space around you. You can't really, the space looks empty, just like you're like, it's empty space. But what's the potential inside of the space is the idea. How much things can this space do? How many, how much energy is stored inside of the empty space? When you look at darkness, darkness looks kind of empty. What's in the darkness? Nothing. But how much energy is stored in darkness? And the Tao is saying there's infinitely much energy stored in the darkness. And like... You're a relentless man, it means you have very likely a craft you're trying to work on. What this means is that, well, to work on your craft, you're going to have to draw on creativity. You're going to have to draw on deep intelligence and insights. Well, a, a really fascinating fact about humans is that we, we do have access to the Tao. That is, if you really dig in, if you're quiet and silent and you really push, if you really push to find an answer to a question, surprisingly the solution appears it's one of the most remarkable facts about being human is you ask a question if you ask a question very clearly and you expect an answer surprisingly an answer appears in your mind it's the most trippy thing you can ever think about and and it's basically any question you ask usually if you ask a question precisely enough if you have a problem and you break it up into questions and you ask questions answers begin to appear in your mind. So this, where, where do these answers come from? I mean, they may tell you that it comes from the brain, but I don't buy that idea entirely. I think that sometimes I get the impression that the answers come from some other place. It's the answers, they come from somewhere else. That place is called the Tao. And the Tao is infinitely capable. That means the Tao has infinite wisdom. The Tao has infinite creativity, which means that you have access to infinite creativity. You have access to infinite intelligence. And if you're willing to stay still, if you're willing to really seek to know, if you're really willing to push to find the truth, you realize that the more you push, the more there is to push for. There is the amount of knowledge and intelligence and wisdom that you can gather is basically unlimited. And that's what, that's what the, the verse is talking about is that the Tao is like a bellows. It is empty, yet infinitely capable. The more you use it, the more it produces. It kind of makes sense. The more you seek to find a creative solution, well, you'd think that, okay, you've really thought creatively and solved the problem, that now it's impossible for you to think any more creatively. And you realize soon enough that if you try to push to find an answer, if you try to push to get a more creative perspective, well, you'll find that there is actually more creativity to draw on. If you think of creativity as a well, the more creativity you use, the more creativity there is for you to use. So that's what he's talking about here. And it's the same with courage as well. If you're having trouble, you don't feel courageous, well, take just one courageous step. Let's say you're having trouble saying no to people. If you say no to one person, you discover that you have even more courage to say no to another person and no to another if uh, you're not sure if you're able to do something, right? Like, and this is uh, one of uh, the most interesting uh, uh, cases of this. So if you ever hear a marathon runner being interviewed, these guys run like really long ultra marathons. And they usually describe a moment. I've heard it so many times now where they, they've been running and maybe they have a couple of miles left and they feel their body and they're like, I don't have any energy left. There's no way I can possibly run 100 miles. It just can't happen. I'm too tired. And then inevitably, the elite marathoners, when they ask them, well, what do you do at such moments? They say, I focus on putting one foot in front of the other. They just say, look, can I have? do I have enough energy to put one foot in front of the other? Yes. And surprisingly, when they put one foot, if they put the right foot in front of the left foot, they realize they have energy. Somehow the energy appears 
to get the left foot in front of the right foot and then more energy appears to get the right foot in front of the left foot and it's just fascinating and eventually they run a freaking 100 miles where did the energy come from the more they draw on the energy the more energy there is to draw from the more you use it that's what the verse is saying here is that the more you use it the more it produces the more you talk of it the less you understand what this last stanza says is that the Tao is something that you cannot capture in words. It's not something you can define clearly in a textbook. So if anybody ever tells you they understand the Tao, or they tell that they understand God, or they tell that they completely understand creativity, in fact, if anyone ever tells that they completely understand anything, that's you should doubt what they're telling you. Because part of being relentless is the realization that you will never, there is nothing that you know for sure. There is everything, there's always something left to learn about anything. There is, you can never grasp anything completely. Right? There is nothing you've grasped completely. That's why if, I mean, if you just get a picture and you try to understand the picture completely, then get another human being and ask them to talk to you about the picture and they'll, you if you listen, they'll tell you something you never noticed before about the picture you, you, you've been looking at maybe for 10 years. And that tells you that it doesn't matter how hard you try, you'll never completely understand what's in a picture. In the same way, you'll never completely grasp an idea. There's always more to grasp about that idea. So if you can't capture a picture, if you can't completely capture an idea, well, it's the same thing with the Tao. It's, the Tao is something that you that can't be grasped. It's something that you cannot capture or define clearly. You can see manifestations of it. You can see instances of the Tao at work, but you can't really grasp it. And that's why it says here, the more you talk of it, the less you understand. The Tao <laughs> or the creativity and the courage and the insights and the strength, these are the sorts of things that you don't really, you can't really talk about. The way to access them and gain some understanding of them is to experience them. When you stay really quiet and you listen to your intuition, th th that's, that's how insights come to you, not necessarily through talking about it or brute force techniques, etc. So that's what this verse is getting to. And then the, the next part of the stanza says, hold on to the center. So what this, what this part is saying is that by what it means by hold on to the center is be present. Well, what does being present mean? It means wherever you are, be there. Whatever you're doing, do it. If you're seated and talking to someone, you're seated and talking to someone. You're not thinking about the future or the past. You're completely focused with that person. If you're listening to this podcast right now, you're listening to the podcast right now. If you're washing a dish, you're really washing a dish. You're not thinking about uh, how work was later, early in the morning. You're not thinking about the meal you're going to eat. You're just washing the dish. If you're eating a meal and you're chewing, you're just focused on eating the meal. You're not thinking about uh, anything else. That's what it means to hold on to the center. And what, what Lao Tzu is saying here is that when you hold on to the center, when you're completely in the moment, when you're focused completely on what's happening right now and you're not distracted, that's when you're able to access the Tao. That's when you're able to access Tap on, tap into this infinite intelligence, this infinite courage. That's when insights come to you, when you're still and you allow wisdom to come into your mind. And this brings me to an important idea. So there are many ways to learn information. And ultimately, you want to kind of maximize these sources. One way to learn is to learn from people. You talk to people and you learn a lot from them if you're willing to listen. Another way is you read books. If you read books, well, you learn a lot from books as well. That's another way to learn about the world. But people tend to forget one of the most important ways to learn. Another important way to learn is to learn from yourself. And how do you learn from yourself? By being still, by being quiet, by slowing down and allowing wisdom to flow through you. Where does that wisdom come from? The Tao. And that's another way to look at the Tao. But again, you can't really define it. But yes, if you really listen to yourself, answers begin to come from deep within. And if you get to the point where you're able to learn from yourself, learn from others, then 
that, that that's that's the beginning of that's how you're gonna be able to realize your true potential. That's how that's part of what dying empty is. Dying empty is learning. Being relentless is all about learning as much as you can from wherever you can. You learn from evil people, so called. You learn from saints. You learn from sugar. You learn from shit. You learn from books. You also learn from yourself. If you do this, then we say every single day, we say every single day you're a relentless man. All right, let's move on to uh, the sixth verse. The Tao is called the Great Mother. Empty, yet inexhaustible. It gives birth to infinite worlds. The Tao is called the Great Mother. Empty, yet inexhaustible. Why is Lao Tzu using this whole idea of the Great Mother and calling the Tao the Great Mother? Well, okay, so if we just drop to the biological function, what does a mother do? A mother gives birth. What would a great mother be in this case? In this case, great mother is referring to a mother that gives birth to a lot of things. It gives birth to many children. Right? In a biological sense, obviously, there are many ways to be a great mother. But in a biological sense, if being a mother was giving birth, being a great mother would be giving birth to many lives, creating many lives. And here we're saying the Tao is called the great mother. That means that there's a sense in which the Tao is like a great mother. It gives birth to many things. And in fact, the Tao is the sort of thing that, well, created the galaxies, <laughs> created our universe, created the earth, created you. Everything, any remarkable work that you'll ever create will be created by the Tao. So in a sense, it, it this this means that it's, a valuable way to think to shift your perspective rather than thinking of yourself as doing things it's more accurate to say that things are being done through you when you sit down and you write a beautiful poem you may think that you're writing the poem no but the, the poem is being written through you right now it's tempting to think that christian mojaiso is creating this podcast episode but a more accurate description is to say that the Tao is creating this episode through Christian Mojaiso. So the episode is being produced through Christian Mojaiso, but not by him. The Tao takes care of that. Everything that we see, everything that we create is, the, is created by the Tao. And that's the sense in which the Tao is the great mother. Empty, yet inexhaustible. You can't see the Tao. The Tao is empty of concept. You can't capture it in a concept. The Tao is empty of vision. You can't see the Tao. You can't really feel the Tao. So it's it's empty, right? In that sense, like the darkness. The darkness is empty. What's in the darkness? But it's inexhaustible. The power of the Tao, the amount of creativity that the Tao has that you can tap into, the amount of energy you can tap into, the amount of strength you can tap into, the amount of courage you can tap it, the amount of intelligence, the amount of speed. It's basically inexhaustible. It's empty. The Tao is called the Great Mother. It is empty, yet inexhaustible. It gives birth to infinite worlds. What does that part mean? It, it gives birth to... If the Tao created the universe and the galaxies and created everything here, how many things has it created? How many things will it create? Answer, infinitely many. And so... That's part of what it means here to say that the Tao gives birth to infinite worlds. The next stanza says, it is always present within you. You can use it in any way you want. That's right. If you, what's Lao Tzu talking about here? If you really sit down right now and you look within yourself, just stay still, don't think, stay quiet. And in that moment, you feel the Tao. It's, it's the sounds around you, the, the space around you, the, the feeling, the awareness, all of it. That's, that's the Tao. It's always present within you. Sometimes you can miss it. And usually when we're completely lost in thinking or focused on what we're going to do in the future, 
what did they do to me yesterday, etc. When we're in that kind of state, completely lost in thought, we miss the Tao. And yet the Tao is always with us. It's always present within you. And this is a really important fact because if the Tao is always present within you and the Tao is infinitely intelligent and infinitely strong and infinitely courageous and infinitely creative, it means that in your true nature, you are infinitely creative. You are infinitely strong. You are infinitely intelligent, infinitely courageous. Also means that you are you are love and you're infinitely uh, you're infinitely happy too. That is, this is important. This is an important line because it means that because the Tao is also love. The Tao is also happiness. It means that you do not need to look outside of you to find happiness. You don't need to succeed in order to be happy. Success never brings you happiness. You don't need to eat a delicious meal in order to be happy. A delicious meal will not make you happy. You don't need your father's approval, your mother's approval, uh, the approval of your community. You don't need people to like you in order for you to be, <laughs> in order for you to like yourself. You know, nothing outside will ever bring you happiness. Why? Because happiness is already within you. Strength, you don't need to look, you don't need someone else to give you courage. You already have courage within you. And it's one of those weird paradoxes. We have all these things within us, but we think we can find them outside. We think that getting a new car is going to bring us happiness, which is kind of delusional because we already have happiness within us. We think that someone, a professor telling us that we're intelligent will make us intelligent, yet we have infinite intelligence within us. Once you begin to live from this perspective, realizing that the Tao is always present within you. All these traits, uh, all these important things, the intelligence, the love, the strength, the resilience, uh, grit, or any trait that you need in order to realize your true potential and die empty, it's already within you. Your life is just letting it out, expressing it, but it's already there. But surprisingly, and usually people, I mean, the norm is usually, okay, here's the norm. Most people never figure this thing out. So that is, they hit like 80 and die without ever really understood, understanding this phrase. The Tao is always present within you. Others live life chasing success, chasing, uh, chasing great accomplishments, chasing the impossible, feel, thinking that by doing that, they'll finally be happy. And these people usually hit like 70, then they realize, oh, wow, nothing external will make me happy. I bought companies, I had billions of dollars, I still wasn't happy. Happiness can only be found with them. Some people take 70 years to learn this lesson. And those are the lucky ones. Others never do. Not in this lifetime. Okay. But that doesn't mean that you need to take 70 years to learn the truth of this phrase. You can learn it now. At this moment, you can realize that, look, Everything I need, I have already. I don't need to look outside. I don't need people's approval. I don't need people to call me intelligent. I don't need people to tell me I'm handsome. I don't need people to tell me I'm strong. I'm strong already. I'm intelligent already. I'm courageous already. I'm creative already. This is a fundamental truth. And hopefully you'll pick it up now. But if you really pursue the journey of being relentless, you'll realize that the perspective is correct. Difficult to explain using logic, but it is correct. And that's what the stanza is saying. Give This stanza of the verse is saying, the Tao, that is, it is always present within you. You can use it any way you want. All right, uh, <laughs> that's enough for today. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this uh, podcast episode. Remember that this is your podcast, and I'm your servant. My mission in life is to help men die empty. In particular, I was born to help you realize your true potential. Why am I so excited about helping you to realize your true potential? I mean, obviously, I can't help you realize your true potential. All I can do is present you with ideas, and hopefully those ideas will enable you to discover for yourself what your potential is and who you truly are. But... Why am I so excited? Well, why do I do this project? The reason is that, one, it brings me, nothing gives me greater joy than 
when someone gets a glimpse of who they truly are, when someone realizes just how powerful they are, when someone realizes that impossible is a myth, that brings me great joy, just observing that. I've had glimpses of it before in people, and that is priceless. That that feeling just gets me going. And that's part of why I do this is I hope that this episode enable you to have that spark. Just knowing that you have that spark brings me joy. Another reason is that you are born to do something on the planet. You are born to solve certain problems on the planet. And we have many of them. So many. We have diseases uh, that we don't know the cures to. We have people right now dying of thirst and starvation. We have corrupt governments that are not running correctly. Right now, we are convinced that the best model of government is democracy. I mean, arguably, it's the best model we ever came up with. But does that mean that it's the best model we can possibly come up with? I don't think so. What's the next model? What's next after democracy? What system is better than democracy? That's a, that's a question. And I believe that if that's an interest to you, it's a question you can answer. And if you answer that question, you'll make it better, life much better for generations to come. We have people right now who are hopeless. They don't know what to do. Uh, they're confused. They're hopeless. Someone needs to give them hope. Someone needs to realize the strength that they have, help them realize the strength that they have within them. That's a problem in the world. You can solve it. We have poor people right now. So many poor people who don't realize they can amass wealth, who don't realize just how much they have within them. That's a problem you can solve as well. There are many people who don't have an education, uh, who don't have a shot at an education. Millions of people, if I was to guess. Well, you can solve that problem. We're suffering from an issue of energy. We're using unsustainable sources of energy, and that's depleting our earth. Does that mean there is no alternative solution? Does that mean that there is no source of energy that we can harness? We, right? Absolutely not. So, well, the energy problem is big, but I believe you can solve it. So, the, but in order to solve these big problems that we that are facing humanity, you're going to need to become yourself. You're going to need to stop looking for other people's approval. You're going to need to overcome and break rules. You're going to need to learn the laws. You're going to need to push to the limit emotionally, psychologically, physically, spiritually. You're going to need to die empty. And that's what I exist to do, is to help men die empty. So in particular, if you have a question, uh, if you have a comment or you have some, there's an obstacle, something that's holding you back from realizing your true potential and dying empty, please email me about it. My email is in the episode description. Otherwise, thank you once again for listening to this podcast and have a relentless week. Bye.